Say, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So I guess this is project three, do some view plus maybe a more thorough example calculation. Uh, so I'll try to say kind of what, what's happening that's new. So hopefully we remember we have sort of this analysis from, from before. So we kind of chosen this, this origin point to represent our leaf. We have some kind of normal vector we're associating to it. Uh, maybe this is worth zooming in on a bit. Okay, uh, we had some light ray striking at some angle. We changed the direction a little bit just so they're lined up, sort of emanating from the same place. Uh, I think we called this thing uh, the vector L. We had a few angles we were thinking about. One of them was this theta L. And maybe this time I'll emphasize that these are all functions of t. That just means that for l being a function of t, if I plug in a new t value, I get a new vector pointing in some different direction. That's what it means for a vector to depend on time. And for the angle depending on t, this is kind of more like what we're used to. I plug in a different time and I get a different angle. But just remember from sort of previous discussions that an angle isn't really enough to determine the vector it's just kind of one piece of it. We have an angle, then we also have a magnitude we have to worry about. Okay, so I'm just gonna shrink this a bit so we have some room to work with, uh, if I can. Okay, so there's that angle. We had this angle here, which I think I called theta. Ln, which also depended on t. And this was kind of the one we were uh, mostly concerned about, but kind of an intermediate step was finding theta L of t. Or rather, we're kind of choosing um, some function to model that. And maybe what I'll mention here is that this thing was a right angle before. Maybe I'll just call this alpha. And this was set at um, pi halves. So this is supposed to be where the leaf is. And this is like a plane of the Earth. Okay, so we can do that. Earth is a sphere, right? But if you zoom in really, really, really close to something, it starts to look really flat. So we're going to do this like plane approximation if you're you know, the size of a leaf compared to the size of a planet. Okay, so we have this kind of situation is, is what we had before. And let me actually add something here to emphasize that maybe this was part of the data of the leaf, everything in green. The leaf kind of sat at some angle, which we were assuming to sort of be essentially zero, right? It was just lined up with the ground. And we had this normal vector pointing out of it, just directly out. So it was at an angle of pi halves. Um, so the situation we want to think about now is essentially, so this is sort of the first part of the analysis. And we want to modify this just a tiny bit. And let me let's see, what can we keep? Uh, actually, maybe we have to delete pretty much everything. Can we do this? Uh, the idea is now we still have this sort of situation where the leaf has a set origin, but now maybe the leaf is pointed at some initial direction. So 
So maybe something like this. And okay, we still have some, maybe I'll draw the light ray at a slightly different position here. Okay, so essentially the same situation as before. I've just taken the leaf and I've kind of tilted it a little bit. And the thing that's changed is that now we have, uh, what did I call this before? Alpha, let's maybe put three, uh, three angle markers on there to denote that these are supposed to be kind of measuring the same thing. And as before, we have this one was two, theta, ln of t, and theta l of t, something like that. So just remember theta l of t was really, it really doesn't depend on the leaf at all. So it's really just measuring kind of where the sun is in the sky um, over time. Um, and theta ln of t is measuring the relationship between the leaf and the uh, the position of the sun. What alpha is, is alpha is like, what is the initial angle of a leaf? Um, just as you find it, it might not be flat, it might be tilted askew. In fact, it probably will be. Um, and I think for part of this project, you actually need to like go out and find a leaf on a tree and kind of estimate this angle. Um, so you might have an angle like this pointing off, you know, to something I don't know, off to the left hand side, you might have something where it's kind of rotated the other way, where the angle is bigger than pi halves. So this is kind of the, the new thing. And so we need to do a little bit of analysis here um, to figure out how, I mean, how does this, how does this play into things? So the first thing to notice here is that uh, maybe if I do this, I can take alpha plus, I'm sorry, I guess I should mention that this angle here is still a right angle. It's just that, yeah, the, the normal vector coming out of the leaf will always make a right angle with the leaf, um, but we're worried about the angle that the leaf makes with the actual ground. So that's what this alpha is. Um, but if you just take alpha plus theta ln of t plus theta l of t, Um, so alpha doesn't actually depend on time, it's just a constant. These other two angles do depend on time, um, but they have to satisfy a relationship at every point in time. Um, and that's namely that all of these, when you add them up, just have to be equal to pi. Because right? if you imagine at some early time in the day, you have a very small theta l and kind of theta l in is very large, and it fills in you know, the gap for the, you know, between those. Um, if you just add alpha onto that, you get the full, you know, sweeping out a half circle. Um, but, you know, just kind of moving the light vector around just changes the relationship between theta L and theta LN. Um, and when you add alpha to it, you still end up getting, you know, the full half rotation. And so what's nice about this is that if you have, so maybe you have functions for these, Well, okay, maybe you have a function for this one, for example. That you've uh, come up with and you've sort of justified why it should make sense in this context. Then you can just write theta ln of t is equal to, uh, let's see. So really, we just want to move everything to the other side, so pi minus alpha minus theta L of t. And that's probably a good formula to have on hand. Um, namely that you really only need to do theta L of t and then theta ln of t is related to uh, it in a certain way. So these functions aren't really independent. Really one of them depends on the other one. Um, okay, so I mean, then the task is, 
Okay, what is what is this thing? What is theta LFT or what's a good choice here? So if we're trying to find out kind of what function this should be, I would do something like this. I would kind of go to my picture and I would think about um, some different values I can pick out. Uh, so I know that maybe theta L at time zero, all right, this is just the plane, or sorry, the angle that the, the light makes with the plane of the, um, the plane of the earth. And so maybe I know that theta L of zero is just equal to zero. I'm just trying to find some interesting points on this graph. Um, I know that theta L at 12 noon should be pointing straight up, uh, straight up. So theta L at 12 will be pi halves. And maybe theta L of 24 should be equal to pi. Right, this is the, the situation when the orange line is pointing straight to the left. And if I just kind of assemble and I kind of know plus it needs to be periodic. So maybe theta of L 20, or sorry, uh, maybe T equals theta L of 24 plus T. Just means that if I go out and measure the angle at 3 a.m. today, and then I go out and measure it again tomorrow at 3 a.m., well, I'd really hope to get the same angle at the same time, um, even if it's a different day. So this is what we mean by periodicity. And okay, if I have this, now I can start to assemble some kind of graph of what I think this should look like. So what do I need to measure on the axes? I need a theta L as my dependent variable, and it depends on T. And I have some points. I have 0, 0 is a point. Uh, this is 12. And pi halves is a point. And pi 24 is a point. OK, so there's sort of a lot of functions that could do this. Um, you know, maybe it does something like that. You know, saying you can sort of come up with any function you want here. Um, what I'll do for the example is we'll just kind of go with what's in the project handout and say, let's assume it's linear. So OK, I kind of missed the point, but let's make it bigger so the line actually goes through them. OK, let's uh, label these 12 pi halves and 24 pi. OK, so now we've, we've checked this off, this off, and this off. We just need this periodicity thing. So maybe what I'll do is assume that it just repeats. I'll assume that like 24 hours, we have one full period. And somehow this is the whole thing with periodic functions is that we only ever need to know one full period because we know we can just kind of duplicate and mirror it um, everywhere else. So we know that it kind of continues like this, or maybe I'll just even draw it in with an actual. Actual line there, but important to, to know that this is just one full period. OK, so this is some function theta L of t giving this line. And how do we find what the actual function is? So f of t is question mark. Uh, well, I guess I can just do point slope, right? So let me just pick, I mean, let's just pick two very easy points. Let's do 
So use point slope. From our distant, distant, distant memories in this class, I have two points, so I can determine the equation of a line. So I don't quite remember what the formula is, but I know I can calculate the slope. Uh, it's always like a change in y over a change in x. But oh, look, one of the points is 0, 0. So <laughs> the change in y is just pi halves. The change in x is just 12. So this is pi over 24. All right, we're just, you know, we're subtracting a 0 off in the numerator and the denominator. So we just don't even have to worry about it. And just double check to make sure this matches up. Yep, OK. So we have a slope. And we can just patently see what the intercept is. I think here we want b equal to 0. So maybe what we actually want for this function is it to be like a closed circle at 0 and maybe an open circle at 24, and then a closed circle down there, continuing in that way. Because right, we, we do have to make sure this is a function. If we filled in both of those circles, I would be looking over one x value, and I would be seeing two different y values. So what does the function return? Well, it has a choice. Functions don't know how to make choices necessarily. Um, so we, we have to pick one for it. But OK, we have a slope. We have a point. And that's all there is to it. Theta L of t is pi 24ths t. And I mean, plus 0 if you want. But so we have we have some function that's fit to that. And importantly, this is in radians. It's like I kind of mentioned in a previous class, like you really just want to be working in default in radians whenever possible. Um, this kind of makes makes life a little bit simpler when you're doing these equations. Otherwise, you have to put in some conversion factor involving a 2 pi and a 360. Um, so you can do that if you want, but you have to pick one convention and definitely stick with it for the whole project. And what's really nice about this is, let's see, we had an equation somewhere. Here we go, this one. For what theta ln was. So just drop that here. And now we know that this is pi minus alpha minus uh, pi 24ths. Okay, so we have uh, a, a model for this this function too. And let me, yes, yeah, so I might have a demo that might help um, explain what this should look like. Give me one sec here. Okay. Let me turn off some stuff here. OK, so here we just have theta L of t just at you know, 0, 0, and 12. Well, it's going to give us some numerical approximation, probably. But yeah, 1.5 is approximately pi abs. So that seems to work. Um, 24 is pi up here, 3.14-ish. OK, and then if we just do theta ln, uh, that's the function we get for it, uh, which seems to make sense, right? So it should be decreasing throughout the day. It should start off at a max, right? If you have the, the angle of the leaf being orthogonal to the angle of the sun at time zero, and as the sun is sort of rising, then the angle should be getting smaller. Uh, but yeah, then there's there are a few things to to consider here. One of them is that um, eventually, if we go back to this picture, 
let's see, this one here. One of them is that um, if your angle is kind of pointed off to the left like this, you'll have a small issue because once you, let's see, if you're like here, for example, um, then it'll actually be, so you'll have like sunlight hitting the back of the leaf instead of the front. So it's not going to be absorbing any uh, actual energy until like some fixed time, like whenever it passes this plane. And you'd have kind of a similar problem if the angle was kind of pointed off to the, the right hand side. Like eventually you would be going over here and like you would be passing the plane on the left hand side and the sun would be coming in behind the leaf. And so you should be zeroing it out for that too. So all I mean by that is that at some point, so here I'm just modifying like how far this function goes. So at some point it actually needs to be zeroed out. And so there's actually a little bit more to do here than just kind of like writing down this function this way. Um, you're gonna have, again, a periodic function, but it's going to kind of max out at a different place and it's going to be periodic with a different period. And so you might have something that ends up more like a, a tent shaped once you kind of figure out how to Right, so if you want to go back to the, the physical situation here, we know that like at least once you're past this point, you're kind of in the the original case where the leaf was sort of flat. It's just that we have to zero it out sort of outside of those cases. And so you should have an angle angle starting at something like zero or something like pi halves. It should be decreasing to zero. And then maybe it should be increasing again. But so you'll you'll need to kind of do some sort of mirroring because whatever's happening and happening on this right hand side of it should essentially be the same thing that's happening on the left hand side. So what'll happen in the graphs here? Is that now you have some sort of shape of a function to start with? And if you're going to actually come up with what your final function will be, so this will be like theta ln of t. This will be a t, right? So we had this, this was kind of our original function was just something linearly increasing. We did this thing, we got something that was decreasing. But what'll happen is that we need to maybe like mirror this somewhere a little bit and maybe like zero part of this out. Uh, let's see here. All right, so you might have something that's more like this. And then maybe it's zeroed out from some specific time. So maybe this is, I don't know, 8, 8 p.m. or something. This is zero. So this is kind of matching up with the situation we had originally, like, oh, wait, no. So let's see, in this situation, we had zero up until uh, some time. So let me switch this up a little bit. So we started off with something kind of like this. Uh, let me see, just erase a bunch of this. Okay, yeah. So you have something like this, except for we have to kind of zero it out for maybe a first part of the day. And then maybe it'll do something like that. And then maybe we'll have to kind of reflect it up like that to denote. So this is sort of capturing the fact that sort of back up in this picture again, at some point you're like directly lined up with the vector and then the light vector starts or the, uh, the angle starts increasing again. So you go somehow up to 
So the angle is decreasing down until it's zero at some point in the day, and then it starts increasing again once you, once you have the vectors lined up. But so you should have essentially a, like a line with the, the same slope or something if you're doing something linear. And you just kind of reflect it like that. And so you get something maybe a little bit more weird for your periodic uh, theta ln. And then maybe this is 24 or something at zero. Maybe this is happening at 12. So it won't be entirely symmetric. You'll have this kind of like check mark shape maybe. Um, and then you'll have to decide here too. I guess you want to fill in this one and maybe leave that one out so you get an, an actual function out of it. If you don't get something exactly like this, it's totally fine. Um, if you just come up with a different theta ln to begin with, that's that's totally fine too. Um, but as long as you're somehow incorporating this analysis and saying how it should match up with what's happening in the picture, then you'll be fine. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so how do you actually, how do you find this point? Essentially, you want to do some kind of analysis like this. Here is the original situation. Something kind of like that. That's the normal vector. Maybe that's our light vector. This one was alpha. This was Theta ln. I'll just drop the t's to keep things quick for now. Uh, this was I'll just make it all the way out here. Uh, this was theta l. So you really want to find what this angle is here. Let's call it um, psi. So what's happening is that you have no energy for, uh, I guess, theta L, maybe less than psi. And okay, how can we actually find that angle? Uh, well, we have to use a few things. This was uh, orthogonal, we can extend this, we can use this thing from geometry, uh, right, if I have Yeah, so two, two skew lines, then like the opposite angles are equal to each other. So like this would be psi. And then this again would be a right angle. So we can use the fact that alpha plus psi equals pi halves. And okay, but alpha is something you know, so you can just solve for psi. So you get some angle, and then you just need to solve for t in theta l of t equals psi. And this will give you some like uh, t0 or something to work with. And if your angle is pointed the other way, you just have to do sort of a similar analysis where this thing is mirrored around. I'll just kind of sketch the picture really quick. So maybe your leaf is pointed this way. Kind of doesn't really matter where you point the light vector, as long as you're consistent about it. And in this case, let's see. This is now the angle alpha you want to measure. Oh, whoops, uh, scrolled. And this is kind of the, so here, here was kind of the, the problematic like sector when we were doing it before. There's just no energy in this kind of red uh, zone. 
And here's kind of the problematic sector if it's pointing that way. There's going to be no energy if you're in uh, this zone over here. So you just have to do some kind of similar analysis, but it should go pretty much the same way. And if you didn't catch all of that, don't worry, I'll, I'll post up notes for this. Uh, let me just make sure I save this. Okay, here we go. Okay, so hopefully that handles the, the case where um, you, know, you have your, your leaf pointed at some angle. So I want to say a little bit about how to fit an energy density function. And before I do that, maybe I'll just, uh, maybe we can take a quick uh, one minute break because this is a, it's a lot of mathematics all at once. So uh, I'm going to grab some coffee. If you want to get up and like stretch your legs or something, feel free. We'll start back at like 40, 847. Okay, so hopefully people are ready. Um, yeah, so this energy density, one thing I found that was like maybe a little bit confusing is that this whole analysis is essentially independent of um, the leaf itself. This really just has to do with like power output of the sun and sort of relation of the sort of how the Earth sits in space with relation to the sun. Um, you could imagine, like, if you're at a point on a sphere or something like that. Let me, let me draw this a little bit easier. And so we're at, like, the North Pole or something. If the sun is over here, these light rays are coming in parallel anyways. So there's just kind of no way you're going to be absorbing any light. Um, and then, you know, maybe after... I guess really we should be should be rotating this, right? Uh, if we do this, it kind of orbits around a little bit. Okay, well this is this is a terrible non-scientific drawing, so please bear with me. But you know, if this is something more like noon, then you have light rays kind of directly hitting that point. And then this is kind of at, you know, maybe the end of the day, more like sunset, and you have something like that. I have no idea if this is the actual <laughs> way that orbit works, but this is just a schematic that hopefully helps you reason about why should this change over time? Well, the Earth and the Sun are, you know, locked into some orbit together, and, you know, the, the amount of energy density is going to depend on how parallel these rays are hitting some small point on a sphere. So, yeah, all of these things spheres. Okay. So just in general, we know we want something that sort of looks like this. So if I just kind of start with a graph and I make some awful sketch or schematic about what I want, hopefully I can reason from it to come up with some actual formula. So I know I want this to start at 
zero zero. Well, okay. So there's there's a caveat here. Uh, let me just make a note over here. And I will say what this is after we've looked at some more of this function. This is mostly just a reminder to me. <laughs> but okay, so maybe zero zero is a point we have, maybe 12, and I think it's like point zero point one three six is a point we want. It's maybe there. And here's 24, 0. And OK, so these are some points we want. And then we also want it to be uh, periodic. So we're just kind of considering one period of it. And we want to extend this out to all of the real numbers by just picking it up, moving it over one period, dropping it down, and just duplicating it that way. Um, OK, so we expect that this is not linear like before. Right? So one thing that you could do is just a tent. And you could find lines um, for that. And you would get some maybe like piecewise equation for the two lines. Um, but we expect that this varies more smoothly uh, than the other one. Well, it's not a, it's not a constant rate of change. Like somehow, um, you know, the change of the angle in the sun over the leaf is like a constant rate. But the change of this energy density is like, yeah, somehow it the rate of change itself changes, which is like a very, a very difficult concept um, to look at until you've taken calculus. But um, you kind of want something with more curvature to it is the best way to say it. So maybe something like this. This is not going to be the exact function we get, but you know we want something that's maybe more smooth like this. Um, and so uh, one idea is to try to fit a uh, fit a wave. So we're going to assume that this has kind of wave-like behavior. And maybe what I want to do, here's kind of a, a microcosm of what I'm thinking, is maybe have something like this, and then just have it repeat. Kind of like that, where this is just like some chunk of a sine wave or a cosine wave or something that I've cut off. OK, so I need to try to fit some kind of wave to this. So maybe I will think of this as a sine wave. And OK, so why did I choose sine? Well, because sine is something, right? If you remember kind of what sine looks like, terrible sketch, something like that, right? So it starts at 0, 0. So that's a nice property of sine versus cosine. Remember, cosine starts up here. Uh, so this maybe starts to look like what I want. And then what I would have to do is realize that this would be like, essentially just this part. Uh, would be my entire graph over here. So from all of this conclude maybe E of T is maybe a half period. of a sine wave. By half period, I mean I have this kind of like parent function here. This is let's be a little bit careful here. This is sine of t. And I'm just using a half period of it to model my, my E of T. But OK, so this says that if we just try to run through this derivation. I can do this kind of general form. 
Uh, so I need an A sine of omega T minus, uh, so usually label as phi uh, plus delta or something. Okay, so this is like I put in all of the parameters I possibly could to control what this, this wave does. And this is where, if I were you, I would start doing some like exploratory analysis on um, you know, like in Desmos or something. So let me pull this in. Like if, if I were trying to do this project myself, this is exactly how I would do it. It's before I even try to solve this analytically and find out what all those parameters are, I would like to know how do these parameters even affect what we're talking about. Um, so this, you know, I've just put in some function where I've made all of those things parameters, um, FT, and okay, amplitude, if I just kind of animate it out, I see kind of what it does. I should be careful, I guess, between amplitude being positive and negative, but I'm seeing that all it does is change the, the sort of uh, displacement. I'm sorry, I guess I should change this to zero to get the, the usual one. But all, all it does is change the the sort of uh, where the peaks are landing. But I have to be a little bit careful because if there's some displacement like this, it's not that amp, you know, here like that we're seeing it's peaking out at like eight, but the amplitude is four. So really the amplitude is like displacement from some like DC level of, so DC being like direct current or some like ground level or something. If you think of this as like an electrical uh, wave, um, Maybe if I do y equals d, okay, not quite. Oh, I called it s here. There we go. Yeah. So it's really that this like horizontal line is some like ground current, and the amplitude is measuring like how much do you wiggle around that. So I think for us, we'll probably be safe enough setting s to zero. The zero zero was a point we were interested in. So that seems fine. Amplitude will probably be determined by um, that maximum we wanted. Sorry, we're only going to do one half period of this thing. I mean, I guess I have a cosine in here, but I really want a sine. Oh, but I guess that was a point I meant to make, is that you could do all of this with cosine and sines. If you wanted to, Here's down here is a function with sine. Um, and the only difference between the two is that if I plug in, well, okay, let me just do this. If I make these exactly the same, the only thing that's different between them, sorry, let me just set these back to the, like, B. Yeah, I think that should do it. Yeah, so the only difference between these is that um, sine and cosine are just phase shifted versions of one another. So a sine wave and a cosine wave are basically the same thing. It's just that the, I mean, depends on how you want to look at it. Maybe the sine wave lags behind the cosine wave a little bit. So if I just put in a correction factor of minus pi halves, or maybe it's plus, then they exactly line up. Okay. So that's all there really is to that. So I could pick a cosine wave and then just like shift it or something like that. Um, but yeah, so maybe just kind of looking at a cosine is, is well, let's just do a sine. Okay, so S is going to, S is right, the thing I'm adding on at the end is control how high up it goes. P inside is this like phase shift. And what happens here is as I move the phase, all it does is just going to pick up the sine wave and literally just shift it off to the left or right. This is exactly the same thing as the, the translations we did earlier in the class. You know, a minus P of a phase shift is going to shift it to the right by P units. The only thing that's tricky here is that your units might be, might be whole numbers or maybe they'll have to be like multiples of pi or fractions involving pi or something. Okay, so that's all a phase shift does. It's just going to move it left and right. 
And then just the frequency, I mean, as we run the frequency up, it's just telling you essentially how many, um, how many periods occur in say like one unit time, or in this case in two pi units of time. Um, and you can sort of normalize this to get how many, how many periods occur in exactly one unit of time if you want. There's a formula for that, but you won't need it here. It's just an idea of like, what do these parameters actually control? So it seems like A is the amplitude. This, this should correspond to that maximum energy we were seeing. The frequency somehow going to be tied to the length of our period of 24 hours. So we'll need to uh, kind of make that work. And this phase shift, probably not so important for us because we're already, we're starting at something like zero, zero. And if S is zero, I think we're good. Okay, so you have to do a little bit of uh, some kind of analysis to justify where all of this is coming from, but you, know, you can kind of read off from this that the amplitude should be equal to 0 0.136. So essentially we're taking this graph here. This is T, this is our E of T. And we're trying to first, without worrying about these two, just kind of fit a cosine wave here or a sine wave. I guess this is the one we're kind of looking at. And then what we'll do is we'll chop off this part. So we need a sine wave that fits this where 24, zero is where the half period occurs as opposed to down here, this would be in just a normal sine wave. Uh, I guess this would be pi zero. But okay, so the amplitude is just how far it's deviating from zero. That'll definitely be just this max value we are picking up here. Uh, let's see. Phase of phi equal to zero. Because fortunately, like it already horizontally lines up with what we want. We're hitting zero, zero with our sine wave. Delta be equal to zero, two, because we don't need to shift it up or down. So really the only thing we have to worry about is, well, I can start with this. I know that the period of this sine wave. Okay, so this is a little bit tricky period actually needs to be 48 hours for this sine wave. And why is that? Um, the thing is that we won't, we only want to keep this like this first half of the sine wave. And so we need to like mo have our model function be periodic with period 48, because that's what a usual sine wave does, right? It has sort of this part where it's above zero and then it has this other part where it's below zero. We're going to chop off the part where it's below zero later but before we do that, we still have to just build the sine wave um, to start with. And this sine wave, it has a half period of 24, so it has a full period of 48. But okay, we know that that's 48. And we can also um, use this to relate it to the frequency. We know that, I guess this is coming from the formula T, the period is equal to 2 pi over omega. So omega is roughly the frequency. And so we get omega equals, hopefully I got this right, pi over 24. Okay, so let's assemble all of this information now. So we get something that looks like E of T is equal to 0 0.136 times sine of pi over 24 times T. I think that is it for this part.
and I would actually go and try to, to graph this before you actually use it. Um, okay, say so zero point, whatever it was, 186. And omega was something like two pi, or sorry, pi over 24. Okay, so it looks flat. That's maybe a good sign. Change our window a bit. So x's should be like t's here. 0 to 24, and then y should be like 0 to 1. Okay, so that's starting to look better now that things are on the same scale. And I need to set p equal to 0, s equal to 0. And then this needs to be a sine instead of a cosine. Okay. So she gets something like this. It should hit the right points, 0, 0, 24, 0, and whatever this max point is, 12 and 0 0.186. And all right, that's the exact kind of thing we were looking for. And now you just need to say how to you really have to be a little bit careful um, with all of these, say on 0 to 24, for example, where maybe we leave out the endpoint. And you want to say something about how to extend this periodically. OK, so in the last 10 minutes here, just say something about the total energy so you can kind of see what expression you're supposed to get. Um, so I think it ends up being kind of complicated. Um, it's good to know like what level of complication to expect. OK, so uh, maybe before I do that, were there any questions on anything up to the energy part yet? So I think this total energy we were calling gamma of t. And from one of the last classes, we found that this was essentially the vertical or the y component of that um, L vector of t times some area. OK, and this thing, you actually have to estimate so I go out and find a leaf. And I think this is centimeters squared, what the units are supposed to be there. And I think we found out that the derivation here led us to expand this part out as E of t. And it was something like sine of maybe theta L of t or theta ln of t. So you'll want to run through that derivation yourself to make sure it makes sense. And OK, now we can just start really plugging things in. Um, this is 0 0.136. So e of t is the thing that we, we just got up here. So it's all of this stuff. And now I need to take this stuff here. And I have some formula for theta ln of t as well. I think it's something like this. And then times a. OK, so that's what maybe this energy function will look like after you've kind of plugged everything in and assembled it all together. Um, yeah, I will say here that there is some way to, like, if you want to simplify these two signs, there's a way to combine these, but you don't really need to. Just having some formula for it is well and good. So now you want to plot t 
versus Z. Uh, and I forgot, I totally forgot the caveat that I <laughs> meant to mention up here. So the caveat is that uh, you may need to shrink this. And what I mean by that is that you might have to redo this analysis with some additional assumptions, like maybe the sun is not up. Like we know it's not up at all, not hitting the earth or hitting this point on the earth, maybe say before 6 a.m. or past 6 p.m. But I claim that essentially everything we've done here goes through in exactly the same way. The only thing we're changing are these two little anchor points down here to 6, 0, 18, 0. And so what you'll get is here we got some, you know, part of a cosine wave like this. The only difference is that your cosine wave will be fit in like that. And then you just have to zero it out for this, you know, up until 24 or something like that. And extend that periodically. So that's the caveat is that you might have to do a little bit of extra or do a little, little bit of different work if you're making that assumption. OK, so maybe what happens is that it's you do this. Uh, sorry, this should be a gamma. You do this gamma of t. Maybe you like try to graph it or something, and you find that it's just 0 in some region. And then it should sort of grow and fall back down like that. OK, so like some of your graph might be down here on the axis for this part down here on the axis for this part, this is 24. And so what you want to do is figure out where this, there's this like T0 here, and T final here. And you chunk this up into, uh, let's see. bunch of t's. So there's t1, t2, t3, and t4. And we're going to approximate the area under this graph. And I want to see if, should I say units here? Uh, yeah, we'll see that in one second here. So the way that we're going to get this area is that we're going to approximate this by uh, rectangles, essentially. Uh, using their left endpoints. So we'll kind of miss some here. We'll pick up a rectangle here. Something like that. I should do these in a different color, sorry. Okay, so that's one rectangle. We're just taking the left endpoints of all of these t's, drawing a rectangle to the, the next t. Okay, so this is all of the area we're picking up in the approximation. Well, I'll draw these in a slightly different color. We're picking up some extraneous area and some, well, so we're missing some area, right? So we're not hitting these parts. And we're picking up some extra area that we don't want, uh, you know, sort of in these spots. So what'll happen here is that the area of this, it's like the total energy going to be equal to the total area here. And it's going to be well, the area of the rectangles plus some error that depends on n. 
And so this is where the red stuff is going into the air, blue stuff is going into the air, the green stuff is going into the, the thing we compute. And so just so you have an idea of, of what's happening here, uh, sorry, I realize we're basically out of time. Let's do one last demo here so you can kind of see what's up. Yeah, so this is kind of what's happening here where we're taking some boxes to approximate the area. It's not exactly right. Um, the idea is that if you take, so n is controlling the number of boxes here. If we were to somehow take a bunch of boxes and it gets way closer to the area and kind of in the limit, if you just take uh, infinitely many, whatever that means, then you would basically get the exact area or this error would go to zero. So that's kind of what's happening here is that now we're taking a few boxes to make an approximation, and this approximation could get better if we took more boxes. Okay, maybe I'll just list out the formula that you might need here. Sorry, just one sec, my notes closed up. So what you will get here is Let's just call this thing uh, B1 for this box, B2, B3, B4. You just compute the area of, say, B1. OK, what's the height of this rectangle? Well, it's gamma evaluated at T1, which is literally this point here is t1, gamma t1. So the height of this rectangle is the y-coordinate. And what's the width? Well, and then it's t2 minus t1. t1, so just a delta t. And so you're just going to add that to area of b2 equals some same thing, except you're going to plug in gamma of t2, now it'll be t3 minus t2, so on and so forth. So take a look at the video that's posted in ELC. Uh, Cal shows a nice way to like do this in a spreadsheet so you don't have to compute, um, I don't know, a million of these. And then just be a little bit careful because the gammas need to eat t in hours. Um, but I think part of the project asks you to break these into maybe like 15 minute intervals or something like that. So you may have to do some some conversion somewhere. Um, so like if your T zero is zero and your T one is 15 minutes, you might have to do, you know, that's maybe one quarter of an hour or something like that. Change it to either all hours or go back into your function for gamma and put in a conversion that changes hours to minutes there. But I think that'll be way more complicated because gamma is a huge function involving t's everywhere. So it may just be easier to multiply this by, so this thing should be watts per second. This thing will be hours, so you just need to multiply it by uh, seconds per hour to get the right units for that. Just like 3600 or something. OK, um, so sorry, kept you guys way over. I'll let you guys go. I'll also stick around for like five minutes here if anybody has any other questions. And I'll try to schedule an office hour today and announce it on ELC. Do you guys have any any questions you want to ask or cool glad it I'm glad it helps <laughs> yeah it's a it's a pretty complicated project but
All right, so I'll go ahead and end the meeting. Just feel free to email me if uh, if you need anything.